Uh, this is about Gideon, the judge of God, the deliverer of Israel during the time of the judges. And so in the chapters of Judges 6 and 7 and 8, we have the story of Gideon. And there's a very familiar part of that story for so much of us as we come to that point. Um, and so we, we uh, first have to take a look at what's going on in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, we have, well, a continued cycle of spiritual decline. It goes over and over, and it starts this way. The Israelites had rest from all their enemies. Then the Israelites do evil in the sight of the Lord. Then the Israelites are oppressed by some invaders. Well, they're oppressed, and then they cry out to the Lord for help. And then God hears their prayers and sends a deliverer. And then that deliverer has victory because of the Lord. And then after that victory, there's uh, some rule over Israel during the next period of time. And the land has rest from their enemies. And then it begins again. <laughs> they do evil in the sight of the Lord. That cycle continues over and over in the book of Judges. And in the story of Gideon, it is really, here we go again. Here we go again, just as it was, uh, as we talked about Deborah and Barak last week, this as well. Here we go again. Uh, this is the last um, message I'll use until after the Christmas season on my characters that I've been uh, studying through the Old Testament. And this is the story of, um, of Gideon, who is judge in Israel for 40 years and has some other things that we are remembered. Now, here we go again, and you, I wonder, well, does consistency count? Because after all, they're consistent. The Israelites did what was evil inside of the Lord. Well, it wasn't. It's not always a positive just to be consistent if you're consistently doing what's wrong. So the Lord handed them over to Midian seven years. Now, Midian, of course, was uh, distant relatives of Israel. It was one of, they, they came from one of Abram's wives after Sarah had died. And so the Midianites, were descendants, they were cousins, distant cousins, but when, when the Israelites had come from Egypt into the promised land, they had to battle against the Midianites. In fact, the battle got pretty fierce and they did some pretty nasty, awful things to the Midianites. So when the Midianites had a chance to kind of regroup as the Israelites settled in the land and, and uh, weren't worried about the areas where the Midianites were in the east and, the, and in the south, they gained strength and they decided that they would exact some revenge on, on Israel. And so what we have here in, in chapter 6, verse 2 of Judges, they oppressed Israel. Because of Midian, it says, the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. You see, this was not... This was not calm. They couldn't stay in their homes. They couldn't stay in their houses. They couldn't stay in their fields. They couldn't, they, they had to abandon all of these things because of the Midianite raiders. They had little forts and safe places that they would go to uh, because whenever the bands of Midian stood against them, they were defenseless to do anything about it. Now, this Midianite oppression was not really the same thing as we have in some of the other times where, where they kind of moved in with an army and the ruler and everything else. This was an oppression that was hit and run. It was in and out. And uh, it was not an occupying or ruler king. Instead, it was these rather unorganized uh, nomadic tribes who came together with many, many people. And they gathered several of the other tribes from the east. And as they came, they came in to take advantage of the prosperity 
of Israel. So this was really not a siege against the city, but a siege against the prosperity of the nation of Israel as they had set up in the promised land. And so here's the way it worked for them. It, in uh, chapter six, verse three, whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and the people of the east came and attacked them. They encamped against them and destroyed the produce of the land, even as far as Gaza. They left nothing for Israel to eat. Well, as well as no sheep, ox or donkey. So they were raiding and taking everything they could find. They were, they were taking the crops and destroying what was left. And it was to the Israelites, this raiding of their breadbasket of the places where their crops came from, the places where their food came from, their herds as, as, well, as, their, um, as well as their crops. This, this felt like the locusts were coming in. And because of the size of the invading force, at least it felt to them and for what they did, it seemed like they would have done just as well if it would have been locusts. It says, in fact, in the record, for the Midianites came with their cattle and their tents like a great swarm of locusts. Okay, now it says cattle here. It often, it actually means uh, camels is another translation for that word there. So they were, they were galloping right on through with quite an attack. Uh, they and their camels were without number and they entered the land to lay waste to it. They came in like locusts. They were sorely oppressed and they were in trouble. They were, they were hungry. They were discouraged. This went on for seven years. And so in trouble again, the same cycle, Israel calls on the God who delivers. And in uh, verse six, it says, so Israel became poverty stricken because of Midian and the Israelites cried out to the Lord. So they, they'd come into Canaan, they'd conquered the cities, they'd taken over the fields and the trees, and they had enjoyed prosperity, they built up, they'd gotten too proud of themselves, they started to worship the idols of the land, instead of worshiping the God who brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the land. And so this was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord let their oppressors take over. But Israel calls out, they remember at this point, at this point, at this point, when things have been bad and they've been bad for a number of years and they don't know what they're gonna do and they're, they're stuck, they call out to the Lord. But the good news is that God hears their cry. And this is kind of amazing when you read through the book of Judges or even worse, well, worse, I guess, even more pronounced is if you listen to it on audio tape. So you listen to a big hunk at a time that maybe you don't feel like reading all at once. And you listen to the book of Judges. It's one of those times where there's so many ups and so many downs and so much evil and God rescuing them over and over and again. These cycles continue. And sometimes you just want to say, why doesn't God just be done with them? But God always hears their cry, which is good news for us because with all of our ups and downs, with all of our ins and outs, with all of our challenges against the rule of God, it's good for us too that God will still hear our cry. It says that when the Israelites cried out to him because of Midian, that God does something. First, he sends a prophet, not a deliverer. There's a slight break in the, in the span here because they called out, God heard, and God sent a prophet because these people needed to hear what God wanted out of all of this, what God was like and why this was a problem. Because when God sends the prophet instead of a deliverer, the prophet comes to remind them of the God who saves. Judges 6, 8, the Lord sent a prophet to that. We don't have the name of the prophet, by the way. This was simply a prophet, someone for the moment who was given the word of God to share with the people of God. The Lord sent a prophet to them and he said to them, 
This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt and out of the place of slavery. I rescued you from the power of Egypt and the power of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. Well, that's the pattern. That's what Exodus was about. That's what coming into the land under Joshua was about. But then the prophet has to tell them that God's law was ignored. They did not pay attention to the stone tablets written in the hand of God, to all of the, the words of the law that were written on the scroll, those which Joshua shared when he said, you know, choose this day whom you will serve, whether it's the gods of the land or the Lord God of Israel. Joshua said, for me in my house, I serve the Lord. But the people of Israel never quite stayed there. And so Judges 6.10, the prophet says, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites whose land you live in, but you did not obey me. Now, when it says here, don't fear the gods, it means don't worship them. Don't bow down to them. Don't give them any obeisance because they don't deserve it. And so that's the prophet reminding them of what the issue is. And then we have those reminders should leave us back to the promise of God's consequence. God had given them promises, promises for good and promises for evil. And you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, the first several verses of that chapter are talking about all the blessings God will give if they're obedient. But then it goes on to describe the consequences in Deuteronomy 28, verse 20. The Lord will send against you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you do until you are destroyed and quickly perish because of the wickedness of your actions in abandoning me. The promises of God, we have to remember if God promises good, he will keep the promise. If God promises that he will withdraw because we don't worship him, he will keep his promise. You have to remember, God is a promise keeper. And verse 38 of chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, you will sow much seed in the field, but harvest little because locusts will devour it. See, there's the promise of what's happening in, in Israel right now. And on in verse 47, because you didn't serve the Lord your God with joy and a cheerful heart, even though you had an abundance of everything. See, God had given them all they needed and more. This is our problem in our country. We have all we need and more. We throw away more food than most countries eat. Um, and, you know, we, we don't understand how to share the abundance of what we have. And because the abundance comes to us so easily, we forget to thank the Lord God who gave it. And we are always in danger of crossing this line between worshiping God and worshiping the God, so-called gods, of our uh, abundance. We have to be careful of that all the time. Well, for the Israelites, it was specific, and that's one reason we have these continued specific notices here. And it says that God then calls on Gideon, who himself is just trying to survive at this point, because the Israelites cried out. They had been oppressed. The Midianites and their, their friends had come in like locusts. They had stolen the crops. They destroyed what was left. They'd taken the herds. Israelite was in, Israel was in poverty. They were hiding in caves. They couldn't stay home. It was, it was an awful time. Now, Gideon himself was just trying to survive during this time. And it says in... Uh, Judges 6, 11, the angel of the Lord came. He sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the, from the Midianites. All right, so there was a big old oak tree. That's where the angel came. It belonged to Joash. It happened to be the father of Gibeon of the Abiezrite uh, clan of the tribes. And Gideon 
he was threshing a little bit of wheat in the wine press. Now, this was not this was not the kind of celebratory event that threshing usually was. This wasn't the whole team bringing in the whole harvest from the crops to the threshing floor and having the ox tread it out and uh, using the wind and singing the songs and gathering the harvest together and storing it up. No, this was Gideon with a few sheaves that he could carry in the wine press, which wasn't being used to press the grapes because the grapes have been stolen or destroyed. Instead, this little circular basin with a bit of a wall was being used to quietly thresh to separate the grain from the stalks inside in hiding from the Midianites. This was not a sign of victory. This was a sign of Gideon and his family just trying to survive. That note of Gideon threshing wheat in the wine press is a note of subjection to the problem that was there. But then we have something that is rather unexpected happens, or at least certainly it was unexpected to Gideon. The angel had come, sat under the oak, and then realized, uh, well, not realized, but, but recognized what everything, what was going on. And so it says then that the angel of the Lord then appeared to Gideon and said, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. I'm not sure that Gideon was feeling much like a valiant warrior at this point. In fact, I'm really sure he wasn't. He was hiding. He was trying to survive. He was trying to get his family through. And the angel says, you're a valiant warrior. But Gideon's despair is really there. His despair is there. Can you imagine compared to what the threshing floor would have been and the celebration of the community and gathering together bushels and bushels. Instead, Gideon's just trying to gather together enough for a month or so for his own family. And his despair shows through as he calls out to the Lord, or he answers the angel. He says, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are his wonders that our ancestors told us about? They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handing us, handed us over to Midian. Well, this despair is common, isn't it? We get in trouble that we have made for ourselves, and then we complain to why God deserted us when God said, hey, look, you pay attention to me, or you won't have me to call on. But we don't call on God. Instead, we worship those things that seem to bring us prosperity that are right at hand, our jobs or our work or our strength or our ability or the goodness of uh, our land or the climate we live in, which, uh, you know, there's probably a reason for drought in this season uh, it, it, because of who we look to for our salvation. Well, the Lord had come, said, hail mighty warrior, and Gideon says, if you're with us, why are we abandoned? Ignoring the fact that it was because of the promises of God that they are abandoned at this point because they turned their hearts away. Our ancestors said, hey, hasn't, hasn't this the Lord who, isn't it the Lord who brought us out of Egypt? But all Gideon can say is, I don't see God working any wonders. Well, that's when it says that God is sending Gideon to deliver. Now, He's hiding in a wine press, trying to beat out enough grain to feed his family. The Lord shows up and says, hail mighty warrior. Gideon says, I don't feel so mighty right now. I'm pretty sure the Lord's not with us. Why is this all happening to us? It was very inward, very depressive cycle there as he talks about that. You read that paragraph again, and it's kind of a cycle of depression that's common with us, uh, any of us who are suffering from want uh, when we're suffering from challenge, you know, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Where is wonders that everybody told us about? I need a miracle and I don't see any miracles happening. But then God says this to Gideon. The Lord turned to him and said, 
you go in the strength you have. Deliver Israel from the grasp of, the, of Midian. I'm sending you. So Gideon's being sent, but Gideon's being sent in his own strength. It's rather curious here, isn't it? You have Midian coming like a swarm of locusts. And so the Lord starts by saying, Gideon, you go in the strength you have, deliver Israel. I'm sending you. Well, that's when Gideon asks for a sign. By the way, he asked God three times for a sign in this chapter. We're, we're usually only used to two. But the first sign he asked, he first asked for a sign from the angel this time. Judges 6, 17. Then he said to him, if I found favor with you, give me a sign that you are speaking with me. And so the, it's interesting that uh, in the scripture here, it goes back and forth between the angel of the Lord and the Lord. So as far as the voice that's coming, but I guess, guess what? When the angel of the Lord shows up, he shows up in order to bring the word of the Lord. And so that's the messenger. And the, so the word of the Lord, the Lord's own voice comes through. And so he asks for a sign. And then the angel says, well, you go, you go, uh, Take care of what you need to do right now. Gideon goes off and he, he uh, prepares an animal. He prepares a feast. He prepares food to bring to this visitor. His hospitality uh, that would be expected and that he wants to give when he has a traveler. And here's what happens when he brings it out. He brings out the meat and he brings out the unleavened bread and he brings out the broth in order to cook it. And so the angel says, go ahead, put the meat and the bread on that rock over there and pour the broth all over it. And then it says the Lord extended the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. The fire came up from the rock, consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. There was the sign that Gideon asked for. Give me a sign and a touch of the staff that the angel held created a burnt offering out of the hospitality gift that Gideon has given. So Gideon recognized this was truly the Lord. He built an altar to the Lord there. He called it the Lord is peace. And it's still in Ophrah of the Abiezrites today. But now Gideon has to take care of the task. I'm sending you. He has to begin with the spiritual disgrace that is in his own family because he has to deal with dad's idolatry first. The spiritual disgrace is in his own family. Why would he not recognize that, you wonder, when he's in the threshing floor or in the wine press uh, trying to thresh a little bit of grain and the Lord's uh, angel throws up and sends him as a warrior and then gives him this sign. Why would he not have expected because of his dad's idolatry that they had been left alone to their own devices? Because we find out this on that very night, the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull and a second bull, seven years old, then tear down the altar by all that belongs to your father, cut down the Asherah pole beside it. This represents the male and female sides of the earthbound deities that, uh, that the Canaanites worship for fertility purposes. And, and Gideon's own father had his own altar for the city that was there. Tear it down, tear it down. Well, Gideon did that, except his was a fearful obedience. He heard what the Lord said. He did not shy from doing it, but he did shy from doing it in front of the people. It says that in Judges 6, 27, Gideon took 10 of his male servants and did as the Lord had told him, but because he was too afraid of his father's family and the men of the city to do it in the daytime, he did it at night. Gideon is just kind of barely working through this whole thing of being called to, of God and, and of moving through this call in order to, to deliver Israel. Well, by the way, the seven-year-old bull 
that he was called to bring. He was called to bring two animals, a young bull and a seven-year-old bull. The seven-year-old bull that he brought, remember they'd been oppressed for seven years? This represented a witness to the oppression that was sacrificed then on an altar in a moment. Um, and so we have that the Midianite, or that the people of the city came out from Gideon, the vigilantes came out. It says that the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son, he must die because he tore down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Beside it. I skipped over the one verse that said that after Gideon had taken down the altar, he had used the pole to make a burnt offering of this seven-year-old bull. That's why that seven-year-old bull was a witness to the, um, to the oppression of the Midianites for these seven years. But the men of the city saw that this was torn down. They came out and, and said to Joash, bring out your son. He has to die for doing this. But here's something that's rather interesting. Uh, Joash, who, had, who owned this altar, who owned this place of idolatry, he said, let Baal defend himself. And here's what he said. Joash said to all who stood against him, would you plead Baal's case for him? Would you save him? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead his own case because someone told, tore down his altar. Finally, it looks like Joash was getting a little smarter here. All right. You're worried, men of the city, because your altar's all torn down. And now you want to kill the man, the one man who did it, huh? Well, one man and 10 servants. So you want to kill him who did it. Why do you want to do that when you're talking about an altar to a god? Let that god defend himself. You want to try and defend against him, well, then you're, gonna, you're not going to live till morning anyway. Well, the the uh, people gave in and allowed this to stand. And so now it's time to assemble an army. The Midianites first, they assemble where the raid against the Israelites would happen in harvest. It was harvest time, we know that because uh, Gideon had taken some of the grain to thresh out in the wine press. And so the Midianites were assembled in order to raid the whole land here. And here's the way it reads. All the Midianites, the Amalekites, the people of the great of the east, gathered together, crossed over the Jordan, and camped in the Jezreel Valley. Well, now that's when Gideon calls out an army. And that's because the Spirit of the Lord had come upon him. It says that the spirit of the Lord enveloped Gideon and he blew the ram's horn and the Abiezrites rallied behind him. Okay, so that's everyone from his clan. And so now he sent messengers throughout all of Manasseh who rallied behind him. He also sent messengers throughout Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali who also came to meet him. So he gained an army here. But his army had, was coming together. He could see the Midianites that were in the Valley of Jezreel. And he was still afraid. So Gideon sets out some fleeces. Now you remember that part of the story, right? Sometimes we have, we want to test God. We say, I, let, me, let me put out a fleece to test. We usually don't ask the Lord to do the same thing to our fleece that Gideon asked God to do to his, but the whole point was Gideon wanted, to, wanted God to send a, him a sign before the battle. So Gideon said to God, if you will deliver Israel by me, as you said, he said, I will put a wool fleece here on the threshing floor. If dew is only on the fleece and all the ground around is dry, I will know that you deliver Israel by me as you said. Well, so God allowed that to happen. And after the first night, Gideon say, make the wool wet, leave the land dry. 
And what Gideon found was a wet fleece. He got, uh, this is what happened. It says in uh, 638, um, when he got up early in the morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung dew out of it, filling a bowl with water. Okay, so the fleece was wet, ground was dry. But you know, Gideon was still wondering if this is really his task. Second night, he asked again. He wanted a dry fleece this time. So Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me speak one more time. Please allow me to make one more test with the fleece. Let it remain dry and the dew all be all over the ground. So he got the picture. Now he wants the negative. You know, he first got the picture. Now he wants the negative. He wants to see the opposite thing going on here. Um, because God was still faithful to him. God wanted Gideon to carry this out. And God allowed Gideon to ask for this test, and God answered. That night, God did as Gideon requested. Only the fleece was dry, and dew was all over the ground. Well, that's good. So Gideon had gone out in his own strength, as the angel of the Lord asked. But the problem with Gideon's army, as the Abiezrites and Zebulun and, and uh, Manasseh and those others came to join with him. The problem was there were too many warriors for God's glory. Because God knew how these people were. They were going to take the credit themselves. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many troops for me to hand the Midianites over to them, or else Israel might elevate themselves over me and said, I saved myself. Well, Gideon was sent out in his own strength and his own strength. This is what he did. He called together all the people he could. He was ready for the fight. And how are you going to thin out the crowd? And God says, first, send away the Frady cats. It's interesting that Frady cats wasn't in my spelling dictionary here. I had to make it up myself for spelling. Uh, but send away those who are shaken in their boots because of what they face. Now, it's, it was huge what happened here. Announce to the troops, whoever's fearful and trembling may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 of the troops turned back. Wow. And 10,000 remained. Well, that's quite a few left over, but that was an awful lot that went away. Well, now he said, still too many. Send away the careless. Judges 7-4. The Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many troops. Take them down to the water. I'll test them for you there. If I say to you, this one can go with you, he can go. If I say to anyone, this one cannot go, he cannot go. So he brought the troops down to the water. The Lord said to Gideon, separate everyone who laps water with his tongue like a dog. Do the same with everyone who kneels to drink. And so this is how we come out with the 300. The 300 who will go against these vast armies gathered from Midian. These 300 were going to be God's deliverance. And these 300 come to Gideon this way. The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with these 300 men who lapped and hand the Midianites over to you. But everyone else is to go home. To those who were cautious, when you read the story a little more deeply, those who were cautious and drank out of their hands so they could watch, keep watch, were allowed to stay. Where the careless, those who just stuck their heads in the water to drink, they were sent away. These 300 were going to be enough. Now, when he sent everyone else away out of the 10,000 that was left, he kept what was needed. And what he kept was these things. He kept, he sent them to their tents, sent them home, but he kept the 300 troops who took the provisions and the ram's horns. The camp of Midian was below them in the valley. Now, not every soldier normally had a ram's horn, a shofar, but about, um, about one in every um, thousand, I think it was thousand, no, every, one in every hundred at least had a ram's horn. And so when these 30,000 left, 
they left 300 ram's horns. So there were 300 soldiers. And so Gideon gave a shofar and a sword to every one of these 300. And here's what it was. It was a midnight ambush upon the camp. A midnight ambush because he was working under the direction of the Lord. The Lord said to him, go up and attack the camp for I've handed it over to you. It was dark, it was night. And so it, God said, if you're afraid, take your armor bearer with you and go, go take a look. And so Gideon and his armor bearer snuck down into the camp and he struck, he, they snuck down into this place where there are just so many of them. The Lord, the scripture says the Midianites, Amalekites, all the people of the East had settled down in the valley like a swarm of locusts. Their camels were as innumerable as a sand on the seashore. Of course, that's a, that's a huge over uh, estimate, a huge hyperbole about what they were facing, but that's a very common way to say, I don't think we can do this. But when Gideon and his armor bearer snuck into the camp that night, they overheard their fear. Why should the Midianites be afraid? It had been seven years they were able to oppress the Israelites. This was the eighth year they were getting ready to steal all of their crops, all of their crops again, and they had a huge army ready to do it. And yet, here's what was going on. When Gideon arrived, this is chapter 7, verse 13. There was a man telling his friend about a dream. He said, listen, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp, struck a tent, and it fell. The loaf turned the tent upside down so that it collapsed. And his friend answered, there, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has handed the entire Midianite camp over to him. Now, I don't know why Gideon's fame was so great at this point, but for some reason it was. They had heard rumors. They'd heard about the altar of Baal, I guess, being knocked down and Baal not being able to defend himself. And the people had come and rallied. They had noticed that the hill uh, side had, had started to be filled with Israelites. They were starting to worry about what was going on. And it says that when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship and returned to Israel's camp and said, get up, get up, get up. The Lord has handed the Midianite camp over to you. And so the attack of the 300, it was broken into three groups of 100 when they went around so they could surround them. Gideon and the 100 men who were with him uh, went to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch after the sentries had been stationed. Now they had a ram's horn, they had a sword, they had a, they had a torch under a pot. So they had pottery, uh, light, sword, and noise, all of this together. And they surrounded them, a hundred on each of three sides, and Gideon and the hundred men who were with him went, they blew their ram's horns, and they broke their pitchers that they were in their hands, and the lights shone around them, and the Midianite camp was fearful because all three companies blew their ram's horns and shattered their pitchers. They held their to torches in their left hands, the ram's horns to blow in their right hands, and they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And as the shout went up around the Midianite camp, and the Midianites in the middle of the night had no idea what was going on. They woke up and they saw the lights. They heard the noise of the crashing pottery. They heard the ram's horns. They heard the shout. And they were so afraid, they grabbed their swords and they started swinging at anybody they could find. And it turned out that the Midianites self-destructed themselves in fear. Here's the way, when Gideon's men blew their 300 ram's horns, the Lord caused the men and the whole army to turn on each other with their swords. They fled to Akashia house in the direction of Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Mahola near Tabath. And so, Gideon's, Gideon overcomes them, but there's an error in Gideon's import, end point. He overcomes the Midianites. He gets the rest of the uh, troops that had uh, backed up while the 300 went. He gets the rest of them to chase them and destroy them and push them out. They were not gonna be a problem to them for a long time, but there's an error in Gideon's end because we read in 
in uh, Judges 8.22, the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you as well as your sons and your grandsons, for you delivered us from the power of Midian. The people wanted to set Gideon up as king and as a dynasty. Now, there was a good start to this because they weren't giving up right at first. It says in Judges 8.23, Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you. My son will not rule over you, but the Lord will rule over you. Remember later on in the book of Samuel, Samuel says, what are you asking for a king for? Isn't the Lord your king? Gideon wanted the Lord to remain king over them. He didn't want to take that role. He didn't want to set up a dynasty. And so at their insistence, even though he was in, they were insistent to him, he backed up, but they wanted something, some memorial. So he says, all right, bring me the booty. Bring me all the gold from the nose rings of those you conquered. Pile it up here. And there was a whole bunch of it. He melted it down and he, he made it into an ephod, a breastplate, a bright breastplate of gold that he would be able to wear. But he set it up in, in his house. And this turned out to be a poor finish for Gideon. Gideon had a great start. He had a poor finish, and this is really too bad. Gideon made an ephod from all this. He put it in Ophrah, his hometown. Then here's the problem. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there. That's strong words, but that's how God feels about it when we worship anything besides him. It became a snare to Gideon and his household. Good start, a poor finish. Now, Gideon's legacy is this. He answered God's call, uh, but in the meantime, he tested God three times. Well, you want to be sure, right? He defeated Midian with victory, the victory of the 300 against their huge tribes. But he succumbed to the gold, to the riches that were there. He judged Israel 40 years. Judges 8.28, so Midian was subdued before the Israelites. They were no longer a threat. The land had peace for 40 years during the days of Gideon. But Israel wasn't led away from idolatry. And sad end of this story, starts the cycle again. But it, when Gideon died, the Israelites turned and prostituted themselves by worshiping the Baals and made Baal Berith their God. The Israelites did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hand of the enemies around them. And they did not show kindness to the house of Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, for the, all the good he had done for Israel. Zerubbaal, that name means let Baal contend. In other words, that was the name given to him when his dad said, um, let Baal fight for himself. Well, Gideon said, or Gideon took that up and he took up the fight against those idolaters. He won, except he was not successful in getting idolatry out of the land where he had given in to idolatry in order to honor that big stack of gold from the booty. You see, this is always a problem for us, is the temptation to worship what we have gained as if it were our God. Gideon had that problem. It said the ephod became a snare to him and to Israel. And it went even worse. They began to worship it as an idol instead of worshiping the God who caused the victory. That's our problem, always. We will tend to worship what we have instead of worshiping God. That's why a Thanksgiving celebration is so important to us to remind us 
to be thankful to the one who gave us everything we have, to put God first again, to say we have this bounty, but God is the giver of all. We have to remember that, remind ourselves of it, and continue that over and over again. And as we celebrate a thanksgiving, let us celebrate. Let us celebrate the God who gave it, our Savior, our Lord, the one who has given us victory, prosperity, and grace. Let us pray together. Lord, thank you for this time and for your goodness and for this word that reminds us once again, even at a Thanksgiving time, that if we forget to focus on you, we lose track of your grace and wonder given to us. Help us, Father, to worship you, to thank you, to be yours in Jesus' name.